But I want to talk about space this morning because as a young boy I was absolutely obsessed with space where exploration. where I lay down and go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's brilliant. This is brilliant science. It's really brilliant okay. science. So, um, three, uh, today, three crew members are scheduled to begin their return to Earth today from the International Space Station, which blows my mind, the fact we have an International Space Station anyway. And NASA is providing live coverage. So NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara, Ros Cosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky, and spaceflight participant Marina Valiskevia, something like that, of Belarus, will depart from the station's RASVET module in the Rosmokos spacecraft. This is going to be um, televised by NASA. Amazingly, O'Hara is completing a mission spanning 204 days in space, and it covered 3,264 orbits of the Earth and 86.5 million miles. I like this one. After they land, the three crew members will fly on a helicopter from the landing site to the recovery staging city of Karaganda in Kazakhstan. Right. As we can see, this is a live feed actually from NASA. So uh, that was pretty good timing, wasn't it? So these are the astronauts returning uh, from the International Space Station. Joining us now is Andrew Lound, who is nothing other than a space expert. Good morning to you, Andrew. Good morning. Thank you for having me on in this exciting day. Look at that outfit you're wearing. What are <laughs> But look at the look at the timing here, Andy. I mean, it's pretty pretty amazing stuff. Am I am I uh, sort of on my own to be excited about what's going on? No, you're not. I mean, this is quite important. This shows that the the international cooperation in space is continuing, even when things on the earth can be a little bit ropey. It's still happening, especially when you look at the the crew which is actually retur uh, which is returning here. Uh, where you've got a, a Russian cosmonaut, a Belarus cosmonaut, and an American astronaut uh, returning after doing their work in space. Um, so that's really quite important indeed. And, and Belarus, it's their first woman in space, so it's quite an important element for them as well. And a relatively general citizen, um, because she she won a competition, essentially, um, to go into space. I mean, it was very similar to the competition we had for Helen Sharman to fly into space many, many years ago. Uh, but she has experience in, in flying because, of course, she's a, a fl she's a trained flight attendant. Mm. Uh, she's a parachutist. So she's, she's a, quite an expert person to go up there. And that's quite important because that's showing how it's expanding the work of, of people in space. And again, it shows you what cooperation can still go on in the world if people actually put their minds together. And the superpowers such as the United States, Russia, China, Europe, because we wrote Europe together with the European Space Agency one here. If they all cooperated and worked together, it's amazing what could be achieved. Absolutely. Can you just explain to people watching this and indeed to children watching this what we're looking at here, live feed from NASA control itself? Uh, yes, what you're seeing is here is the central module of the Soyuz spacecraft, which is now um, coming down. Um, the parachute is there. I, it's quite a fantastic sight to actually see it. It vented off um, material. Its peroxide was vented off a bit earlier, so you had these great vapour trails coming off of it, which also helps as a marker for it. It's not designed for that, but it also helps as a marker. So you see the huge parachute now as the crew members are in that little capsule which is at the central section of the Soyuz. Um, I'm not getting any picture feed from you at the moment, so I, I don't know what you can actually see. Have you just got the screen on at the moment? Yeah, yeah so, so we're, we're essentially watching the parachute come down. Right, OK. It, so, which... yes, so there it is. That's the central section of the Soyuz spacecraft with three as, as crew members on board coming down. It's a long descent which is coming down. They're about 3 minutes 23 seconds away from actually touchdown. And in, in Russia, they actually touched their spacecraft touched down on land, not at sea. Um, and that, that goes back to the Soviet Union days because the Soviet Union had, was a huge landmass. I mean, Russia is mm. still a huge landmass. And um, the Americans, of course, had huge naval fleets so they could pick their crew members up from the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean, usually the Pacific Ocean, without any problems at all. But the Russians had to be a bit more careful with that. So they designed their spacecraft to come down on their landmass purely for protection um, as a security measure. I mean, but that's what they continue to do. I mean, it is extraordinary. I mean, there's another story, actually, as we watch these pictures there's another story this morning because obviously space travel has evolved so much we're taking these pictures for granted actually but mm. but um, the the uh, president uh, of the United States has said that actually because of uh, what's going on and the need for space exploration of course what they want to do is to use the moon as a landing stage to get to other planets as well yeah. that what they're gonna have to do is to create its own the moon's own time zone yes 
Well, that makes sense. Now, if you think about it, on Earth, because we have time zones, and this makes life easier for us when we're moving around, and, and that, that start, time zones on Earth started because of the railway network. Because, of course, depending where your position is, uh, in even in your own country, and where the sun reaches its highest point at noon and when it sets, um, it's very different depending on where your location is on, on the Earth. So when they started having the railways, times became out of sync. So they had to have a single time zone in order for the railways to run up correctly. Now, when we're going to the moon, because we're going to be staying on the moon, we need to actually do that, quite importantly. Uh, there are several reasons for that. One, if you're actually operating on the moon with moon bases on the moon communicating with each other, um, you can't really do that via Earth because there's one in a... Well, one and a quarter second time lag. So, so this is this is the bit I didn't know. The mm. because um, time moves faster on the moon than on Earth. Fifty-eight point yeah. seven microseconds faster a day. So therefore, any clock here on Earth is not relevant to moon time. Yeah. That's right. The further away from the centre point of gravity you are in the weaker gravitational field, the slower time is. And that happens with satellites going around the Earth. Satellites going around the Earth, their time is different from that from a clock down on the Earth, which is why you have to adjust GPS to take that into account. Now, on the Moon, that's even worse. You've only got one sixth gravity on, on, on the Moon, so time is going to be very different. So you can't have a time-based system centralised on the Earth because everything would lag behind uh, or ahead, depending where you are on the Earth or the Moon, because it's relative, um, for transmissions. And that would happen, for instance, for you're going to have to have GPS positioning systems for the Moon, and that just simply won't work unless you have your own time system on the Moon itself. So it's absolutely essential for good operations on the Moon, safety operations as, anything, as much as anything else, that the Moon has its own time zones. And NASA, working with international partners, is working on how to set a time zone on the Moon and whether it'll be divided. And also you've got the issue, of course, on, on astronauts having to work out how their day works. We work on a 24-hour clock here because the Moon doesn't work mm. on a 24-hour clock because there's 14, uh, 14 Earth days of daylight, 14 Earth days of night. I find it fascinating. They're going to call this coordinated lunar time. Now, also, here on Earth, we measure our clocks using atomic clocks as well. And if you remember, we yeah. actually added some seconds, didn't we, at one point? I think in 2016, we added a leap second. Yes, that's correct, yes, because the Earth, Earth is changing all the time and the Earth's rotation alters, so, so things have to be adjusted to take that into account because the gravitational drag between the, the Moon and the Earth and the Sun does actually change the way the Earth rotates. Also, mass changes on the Earth as, as the internal mass of the Earth moves around can cause some different alterations to the spin of our planet, and therefore the atomic clocks need to be adjusted to take all that into account. I find it absolutely fascinating, and of course we can't rely on clocks here based on Earth, and particularly if you've got international bodies working on the Moon, yeah. and of course this is the staging point, as I said, for planets like Mars. Let me just ask you about a final story, if I may, as we watch these live pictures coming in from NASA. We talk a lot about energy in uh, this country and indeed around the world, trying to go to green alternatives and so on. And we've seen all these solar panels stuck all over the place, blighting the landscape. But this is a brilliant story. A company hoping to launch the first solar farm in space has passed a critical milestone. This is a, a company called Space Solar in Oxfordshire. They mm. plan to power more than a million homes by the 2030s, so not very far away, with mm. mile-wide complex of mirrors, solar panels. But all of these solar panels, not here on Earth, they're going to be in space. Yeah, this, is a, this, this has been a dream, actually, since the 1950s, when people started looking at how we could get power. If we could actually use solar panels... And there panels. we are, I can just see, by the way, uh, that capsule touching down uh, from the live feed from NASA. Sorry, Andy, you were saying... No, that's right. That's brilliant. The yes, because uh, if you could put solar panels in space, it's going to be far more efficient than have them down here on Earth, because the Earth's atmosphere absorbs a great deal of of the energy and it scatters it and so on. Whereas in space, it's pure what we're getting from the sun itself. And the big trick is going to be to allow the solar panels to constantly look at the sun as the spacecraft moves around the Earth. But they've they've done a test on that, and that has actually been solved now, which is really quite a fantastic achievement. And then you can beam the energy down to uh, receiving stations on the Earth um, using, uh, with microwave. You convert that energy into microwave beams and beam that down there on the Earth. And before anybody panics and thinking, does that mean we're going to get microwaves beaming down frying things. It doesn't work like that, fortunately. The energy is 3% uh, as strong as a typical countertop microwave oven. But that would be enough to actually get energy down here into a storage facility, store that energy, and then transmit it 
uh, and then distribute it accordingly for our use on Earth. This would be quite fantastic. I mean, 13 times more energy you can actually collect in space than you can do on, on ground because of the light intensity. And they're looking at about a 2,000 tonne solar power station, which can use SpaceX's giant rocket to actually put... Um, these into space. So it's actually quite practical now. We actually have the cost effectiveness to actually put uh, these into space. Absolutely. And I was going to say, actually, the advent of SpaceX has changed all of this, hasn't it? Because the cost yeah. of, of travel into space ha has fallen dramatically. It has, and, and they're going to do the fourth test of the big booster rocket because everyone's saying, oh, well, it's going to go to the moon. Yes, but it has other capabilities. It can put huge amounts of material into space. And this would be one of the most practical things to do because if, cause Britain seems to be at the moment leading the world with this at the moment, although other countries are trying to get in on this technology. I mean, we would be there for, a, if we get this to work, we would be a principal exporter of energy. <laughs> can you imagine that? Absolutely. Brilliant stuff, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us. That's Andrew Thanks. Lamb there, space expert.